Today, our guest is Brad McIntyre. He is a fourth generation regenerative farmer from Caldwell, Idaho, just outside of Boise, Idaho. He is married to his wife, Jill, and together they have six children. He works alongside many family members, including his father, Loren, and his brothers, Ben, Brian, and Spencer. For the past 15 years, they have been practicing no-till, and nine years ago, they began to introduce cover crops. They pasture-raise a whole lot, including beef, pork, chicken, turkey, duck, and eggs, while producing clean seed for the cover crop industry. Brad has a passion for soil health, and that's why he's joining us here today. He loves teaching and helping people, and yeah, I'll pass it on over to you, Brad, and you can begin sharing your slides. All right. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. He's pulled up. Can you see him? Does it look good? Yep, you can see him. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, yeah, Brad McIntyre here in Caldwell. Um, me and my family, I've got six kids, and, and my brother has four that work full time on the farm. And then I got some other brothers. Uh, Brian currently. Um, works with us and brings his kids off and on. And so the the whole goal of this farm is at this point is to get that next generation going. So my kids being fifth and, and our, our goal is to keep that uh, going through generations. And that's, that's the whole reason why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I, I've been asked today to talk about marketing and finances and selling direct to consumer and that's something we've been focused on since 2015. We got started pretty slow. 2018 is when it really got going. And uh, we, we really dove heavy into focusing all our efforts on direct marketing. Um, so I'm going to run through kind of the, the product lineup that we have. And then, then I'm going to talk about, you know, how we get these products moved. And so... Two years ago, we decided to build a packing facility and an on-farm store. And that's that's really been a springboard uh, for us. We're Caldwell is about 30 miles outside of Boise. So we're in the Treasure Valley. Um, it's really all the city's touch now. There's not too much separation by farms. A lot of the farmland's been taken up. And so we have a, a good base of people uh, in the Treasure Valley that we can market to. So our farm is quite a ways outside of the, the heaviest of population of our customer base. But we, we initially built the store to for packing. That was the main thing is getting all of our freezers, everything put in one spot and being able to pack orders efficiently. Uh, and then we had a the store up front. It was kind of, it wasn't an afterthought, but we were like, oh, we'll have it small there's not going to be too many people that are going to want to come out and shop like a normal grocery store. But when they're here picking up an order, if they want to pick up a few other things, a few random, you know, people will stop in. That's what, you know, we kind of built it for. Well, we had our opening day and it blew our minds how many people showed up on opening day. And then it just continued. Uh, and we still, we've had continued growth on the on-farm store and so we ended up expanding it a little bit, making it a little bit bigger and putting more freezers and fridges in. We still have a little bit more that we want to do there. So the on-farm store has been a big thing for us. Like I said, it was June was two years that we've had it open, um, but it's that's the hub of our business now is all in this on-farm store that where everyone can come and, and pick up their stuff. And so a few other pictures of that, but we have, uh, shipping containers that are freezers outside of the building as where we store everything. We have three, three of those to keep the poultry, pork, and beef all separated. And that's been a, a big blessing for us here on the farm. So we do grass finished beef uh, 100% all the way through. We used to have a cow calf herd. We've uh, actually sold the cows off and partnered with a couple different ranches to provide six to eight weights on the farm whenever they get weaned some in the fall and the spring so we bring them in and we do all the pasturing here we also you know in the off season in the fall in the winter we do cover crops uh, grazing you'll see some weird horned ones in there that is just my brother's ornament we call them pasture ornaments he was gonna he was gonna give uh rides on them but the horns are big enough on those watusis that 
I think they'll hurt people. So that idea has been scrapped. And now they, uh, we actually use them as our leader leaders in the new groups. We now have a heifer group and a steer group. And so they get separated and one stays with the steers and heifers. And then they teach the new group on how to come through the fence and get moved easy. So that's been a big blessing uh, that way. So we sell the, sell the beef. Pigs have their own little section that we have them in, but we rotate them daily on pasture. Uh, and then they, they're on their own acreage that way. They, they were just too destructive for me in the fields. And in my paradigm, I didn't, I wanted to control the destruction and I didn't want to, <laughs> I, I didn't want to have them on every acre. Um, so we do the pork. The, the one limiting thing in our valley, everybody's going to have their own um, unique opportunities and unique uh, issues in their own areas. One of those issues we have is through our USDA processing, we don't have any local, that kind of stuff that you really need to move the pork through. We don't have that uh, ability. So we struggle getting bacon made. We, we send it to Oregon and Washington and we still struggle with, with some of that. And so that's an issue we have. We're, we're working on that, but it's, it's an issue we have. Um, Sophie, I, I see that I had a connection warning. Do you want me to stop my video and just share the screen? Yeah, I you think, can try that. Yeah, I think you sound pretty good now. It was maybe just a, a little bit of a rough patch. So I'd say keep going. Brad, if you just want to okay. go back, I feel like people have questions on this. Um, you started talking about your USDA inspection on bacon. What exactly is it that is prohibiting you from being able to offer that product? They they, they don't have, uh, and you can blurt in if I am not coming through clear so we can get it quick corrected. Um, but they don't have it inspected USDA. They'll do bacon at that facility in Ham but it's all a state inspection. So I can't sell it on the individual cut to each consumer. So if they get a pig butchered, they're hanging, they can get bacon, but I can't take that package back and sell it. So like we sell raw belly, it's cut up like bacon, but it's just raw, uh, nothing done to it. And then people have to do their own stuff to it. And so it really limits us on belly, which is like the, the main thing. So, that's our next, one of our next goals is to get a USDA cure in, in our own facility and be able to take those bellies, make bacon and, and ham and, and get that to the people. But that's, that is the one limiting thing that we struggle with. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to just a second back out here. Because I'm struggling to hear you. All right, is that better? Yeah, you sound pretty good. We'll let you know if there's any issues. All right. So uh we so we built these um movable coops they hold about a thousand birds this is how we do our laying hens so they travel behind the cattle and we move them a lot of our land on some spots is sloped and so we have them in in as many areas as we as we can without breaking eggs that's that is an issue but we move them be, you know three to four days behind the cattle trying to clean up fly pressure larva and they do a pretty good job of, of moving those pats around and getting them to dry out the the one thing we do struggle with is dung beetles i think they clean a lot of our dung beetles up so that's kind of a catch-22 but it makes really good eggs and you know we're able to make pretty good impact on on flies it's not perfect they still have fly pressure but they knock some of it down and so we sell those in individual dozens and also in cases to restaurants. So individual dozens to people and also in retail where they can be resold and, and then uh, to the restaurants. 
We also do meat chickens. That started three or four years after we got going. We didn't do those right off the bat, but we do meat chickens. We built these houses ourselves as well. So they're really low to the ground, um, really windproof. We've, we've never actually had any accidents with them moving. We, we don't stake them down, but they got a drill stem base and, and then we bend these hoops. So they're 50, 15 by 60 and we pull them the 15 foot direction. So the, the birds don't have to walk as, as far. Um, most of the industry pulls them lengthwise and those birds get really tired, especially when they get up into weight. And so we turned the idea on its head because we are like, oh, we're tired of moving these birds forward every single day. And so we, we switched them up and, and started moving them this direction. And that has been a big help. Um, so this is an idea that you, you guys can take, but we've, we've had really good success with these birds. We started with 1200 in the brooder. We have six of these houses, but we divide the 1200 into 400 when we move into the pasture. And so each house starts with, a, with roughly 400 birds in it. That's just an outside view when we got one of those built. Um, and so that's how we can roll up those sides and keep good airflow. So there's, we don't do, we like right now we're over a hundred every day and all we do is keep those sides up, but it's, it's blackout and it's low enough that that air flows through there pretty good. We have no misting systems in there and we just flush water a couple times a day when we're this hot and those birds stay really comfortable. So that's, that's been a big, big thing for us. Um, I always put the feed picture up because it grosses people out, but we sell a lot of chicken feed into stock and a lot of ethnic people buy a lot of chicken feed, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> uh, we do turkeys for Thanksgiving. Uh, we also, one of our limitations in this area is with poultry, we don't have, our USDA processor doesn't do sausages or grind. And so um, we just do turkeys for Thanksgiving and th that holiday time because we can't do the ground turkey and all those other issues, all the other products. So one of the reasons we are looking to putting in a USD uh, facility to be able to take poultry and grind and do the bacon, do those other products and, and diversify our product lineup. And then we could raise turkeys more often. Turkeys are actually a lot of fun. Um, they're, they're like the dogs of, of the poultry world, but we have a good time with them and they're real social and, and they eat a lot of bugs. And so it'd be fun to have them different times of the year instead of just in the heat of the summer and the fall, because they do a good job of, of moving around the pasture and, and affecting more land than the broilers and, and the laying hens do decent too, but the broilers are pretty well stuck in that area. Uh, we do a limited amount of duck. We used to do more ducks than um, we do now. We had a couple chefs in town, and this is one thing is like you really have to move with the market. <clears throat> we had a couple chefs that bought a, a lot of duck from us, and they both moved. And so that next year, not as many ducks sold, and so we, we have to pivot. So we don't have uh, as many this year. We were raising five to 800, depending on the year. And now we're just down to a few hundred. And so it's one of those things that in this business is being as, you know, as small and as local as you really have to keep your thumb on the heartbeat of what's going on with your chefs and with your customers. And, and this is one we've had to change just knowing that the local people buying at the store don't buy it that many duck, uh, whole ducks and cut ups. And so the chefs were the, were the big buyers for those. And so we just kind of have to, move around with what is needed and wanted in our area and and ducks are amazing too they're probably the best forager that we ever have had on the farm in the poultry realm and they just they will go in and mow stuff down this is this pasture is too big for for them at the moment but any anybody that's raised animals in pasture you, you have these ebbs and flows especially when we're trying to irrigate around things but they they'll still take all that that pasture down. They every day, sometimes multiple times a day, we got to move these guys 
because they're just taking so much down. So uh, part of having the animals and having the on-farm store, we do a lot of agritourism. We're, we're, yesterday we gave two tours, personal tours on the farm. We keep that open because agritourism is really important to us when we're bringing these customers out. We want to teach them why ag is important, why the way we raise the animals is important to them, how it matters to their health and to the health of the animal. And so we try to make a lot of opportunities for customers to come to the farm, to see the animals, to get close to them, touch them, do all these things. And, you know, some people have biosecurity uh, concerns. Um, we would rather have the customer on the farm uh, getting inoculated with ag and, and all that biology than trying to keep it sterile and keep them out. We, we, just, we just find a lot of good that comes from keeping those customers on the farm and, and learning uh, rather than keeping them away and, and being scared of it. So agritourism is, is vital to what we do and, and, and why we do it. Um, and, and this is part of it too. We, we try to provide picture opportunities for them when they come to the store. Um, this is one of them that we did, uh, and, and just make it inviting for them to come out. And so this is one other way we graze it down in the fall, whatever the cattle can get out of it. And, and then we go on. So this is a pivot corner that we did this on. So, um, that's my contact information. I'll let, let that up. But part of this, um, when, when going back, I'll, I'll go back to that later, to all these different animals and how to market and how to get started. We, we started small, like everyone does. But the big thing uh, going back, if we had to do it all over again, is we would market and tell our story more and more often and, and stronger than we ever did. Getting the customers to understand your story and why it's important that they become your customer is, is the most important thing. When, when we're dealing with these customers coming straight to you, they need to understand why, you know, so we're soy and corn, corn free on the pigs, we're soy free on the, on the, the birds. Uh, we, we don't certify organic, but we do a lot of organic practices with them. And so them to understand why we are the way we are, why we have chose to do what we've uh, chose to do. And we just constantly tell that story, the good, the bad, everything that goes with it. And so that comes through social media a lot and email. And so if you are getting started in this, um, collecting emails, getting on your social media and getting that going, even if you don't even have any product going, what you're going to be doing. And, and that is the most important thing. Marketing, um, you you can't, I guess you can't shortchange that. You have to market. And I've had a lot of good friends try to get started doing what we're doing and they miss the marketing. They have excellent product. They do a fantastic job with the pasture, but they don't tell their story. And it just eventually the customers leave. You got to constantly be in front of them, telling them why they need to come and buy from you because we're not as convenient as, as a grocery store. We're far away from the city. Uh, they have to meet us at certain times to pick up their orders. They have to get online in order. It's just, it's more work for them. And so we have to constantly remind them why they need to come support us and, and why it's important that they, that they help this little niche of agriculture. <clears throat> so that that's the number one thing. Even even with us as as we've went down the road as, as far as we can as far as we have <clears throat> if we send out an email we see an uptick in orders. I mean it's just it's clockwork. And so it's just it's really important to focus on this part of the farm. It's probably the the one thing that you besides finance, it's probably the one thing that gets ignored the most. And it's so important, finances and, and marketing. If you want to sell meat direct to the customer, 
you better figure out how to do it or you better figure out somebody on the farm or hire somebody that will do it. I will tell you that the farms that are most successful, the marketing story is coming from a family member or somebody really connected right there to the farm. That story needs to be told, uh, you know, someone that is really close to the heartbeat. And that way it's, it's more believable, even though the same message can be shared by an outside marketing agency, it just doesn't come as, across as well um, in the beginning stages. They really want to hear from that farmer. And so don't lose sight of, of the most important thing of, of telling your story and, and you'll be a lot more successful getting going that way. Um, ways that we're marketing, I've, I've said a few of them, but we are getting product uh, to the people via our farm store. And then we have a website through Grace Cart that people can get on and place their orders. They can pick up at the store. They We have six or seven other locations that they can pick up at. And those are specified times uh, during the month that we will meet people there that they will, will have their order ready. They just meet within a half an hour window. We offload the product to them and away they go and, and away we go. So, and then we also do home delivery. And so once a week, we actually have a, a local kid that will come and pick up all those orders around two, three in the morning. He goes out throughout the Boise Valley and delivers those. They have coolers on their doorstep that he offloads the product into. And then um, that way, when the people wake up in the morning, they can put their uh, product right in the freezer before they go to work. And we have very little issues doing it that way. When we deliver during the day, their product would get hot and spoil. And, and so early morning has been the best thing for us on home delivery. We have everything in uh, freezer bags. And if they don't have a cooler on their porch, we will leave the freezer bag. And then we will charge them for that freezer bag. When they return it, they get the credit back. And that way we just, we don't start losing bags, but we just load his car full of these freezer bags with their names on them and we get it to him through the home delivery. That's been our, uh, currently besides the farm store, that's been our fastest growing sector is that home delivery. People are, are all about convenience. And after a few times shopping at the store, we see them transition to home delivery. They, they'll still come out here and there to the store, but they, they want that convenience of just getting it right at the house. And so home delivery, <clears throat> we're actually getting ready to add another day to the week. And so he can, he doesn't have a bigger vehicle. So it's just, we'll just do another day and then he'll, he'll get it done that we pay him by the drop and, and it works out really well. So home delivery is, is been a good thing because of that convenience factor. Uh, we do the retail wholesale um, or wholesale to the retail uh, stores and then wholesale to the restaurants uh, in and that's mainly cases and then a, some dozens that they resell in the store it's not our not our main thing that we focus on especially on the meat side with the margins the way they are we don't have a whole lot that we can give them and so we we don't limit but we just don't give them as big of a break on the meat side as as we do on the egg side um and so that's, we do move some meat in, in that manner, but just not as much as we do with eggs. So, but and it's not something we want to focus on either. We really want to focus on that individual consumer. <clears throat> it's our best margin and they tell the story really well. They, they share it with their neighbors and here and there, we will incentivize them to share with their neighbors as well. And, you know, get something for free or a discount if they bring a, a new customer to the store. There, there's just ways we have to get creative to keep them sharing the message. But they're typically our best advertisement is, is the customers. And so our whole goal is to get all the product moved through the customers. We're, we're about 75, 80% at the moment. Uh, but that is, that's the end goal is getting it to that individual customer. Um, we don't do very much shipping. One of our disadvantages is dry ice in the Boise Valley. Dry ice 
I haven't checked for probably six months, but it was around two bucks a pound when you need six, eight pounds of dry ice to ship that uh, package. It just, it starts getting really expensive. And so we do ship some if people want to pay the full cost, but giving free shipping, we would really have to jack the price of our meetup to offer like free shipping or a discounted or flat rate just because of that dry ice. And we're just not in a great area for that. And so we've really focused on our, on the Treasure Valley and focused on our local customer, keeping the price, you know, as good as possible for them. And then if somebody wants to pay for the shipping and that full cost, they can, but it's just not something that we have focused on as a farm at this moment, something we're going to look into it again and, and see if we can kind of expand that way. But it just hasn't been one of those things. We've been more focused on that store home delivery and, and that's, that's been growing really well. So that's kind of where we market and why. And then, on the finances of all this, I, I will give a little bit of caution or warning. <laughs> it's expensive to get all this going. When you look at investing in cattle and in pigs and, and getting all that investment and all the equipment ready to go and do a business like this, there becomes a lot of overhead. And so I just want you to, I guess, focus and, and look at the finances of before you just dive in or, or build it really slow. Uh, we had the benefit. We were a big custom farm. We were doing a lot of custom hay, around 5,000 acres of uh, hay every cutting. So we had a lot of equipment and we were able to sell some of that equipment and purchase animals and equipment that would build this business. And so we had that blessing. That was an advantage I had from my father to be able to sell some of that equipment and invest. Uh, if you're starting from the ground up, I would start with a species or two and, and just start really slow and organically, build it organically uh, because the overhead can really uh, weigh you down and really cause a lot of expense. It, it, you, gotta, you gotta worry about the overhead anyways, but it just can really strap you down and and with that is, is looking at your margins. Um, you know, we've paid to have a company come in and help us really dig in and really understand our margins uh, because we had the experience to a degree, but we just needed another set of eyes to make sure that we are truly, you know, gaining what we needed to gain to really keep building this business. And so, Kitchen Table Consultants, I'll give a plug out to them. They've done a great job coming in, helping us figure out that story and really understand our margins and, and know what we need to, to keep you know gaining a profit. And it's so important because you don't need to be working for free. You don't need to be giving people uh, cheaper meat than what it costs you and, and you know hurting your family in the end. And so just truly build some spreadsheets, get some spreadsheets from other farmers, but really understand what it costs to grow these animals, to, to produce the meat, the eggs, and, and whatever it is, if it's honey or um, flour, whatever it is that you're trying to sell direct, really understand your costs because they're typically higher than you think they are and your margins are lower than you think they are. And so... That is the word of caution that I would uh, say right now is the finances is, is something you don't want to worry about, but you got to worry about it. You got to make sure that you're you're staying healthy financially and providing this good, healthy product to your community. Because if if you're not, then you're going to go away, and then, then they're not going to have the ability to to support you. So um, I will say, uh, kitchen table always you know, is pressuring us to, to raise prices, get better margin. And when we have raised prices, it's very daunting. It, it just consumes me. But when we do, we haven't really seen a drop off in the customers. Um, you can't get real crazy, but you always need to be kind of moving the prices up because if you do real big jumps, that's when you see the problems. But if you just slowly kind of 
move stuff around because you're keeping a, a good eye on it, then that's when we've seen very little pushback from the customer is just that slow uh, um, increase. And so, um, Sophie, I don't know if there's anything else. That's kind of how we built the business. We just, you know, from 2018 to now, we've just grown it. And that's, that's the base of, of what we're doing. Stop. If you want to stop sharing your um, presentation and then put your video back on, then we can get into the Q and A section. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. That's all really great information. I think you have a really interesting model. Um, I have a load of questions, so I'll try to be somewhat organized with them. So you talked about how you were able to create relationships with chefs, which was like a really good market for a product like duck. How are you going about meeting those individuals and developing those relationships? Did you guys ever go to a farmer's market at some point or um, did you just start with the farm store or how did that develop for you? Yeah, so the Boise farmer's market was essential for our beginning. So we we were selling right off the farm when we were when we started small with laying hens and beef. I was kind of just doing everything right there off the farm with the grace car website and it was it was growing but it was just kind of slow and boise has a really great farmer's market and so we went and joined that and it was just like gangbusters from that point on there was only one other pork producer there there was okay. a couple beef and only one other chicken and so they were sold out of eggs by nine o'clock in the morning and so we were able to take all our eggs in and whatever other meat we had in in the freezer and it that really uh, was a springboard. What really uh, also propelled us is when COVID hit, the market was just starting again for the year and COVID hit. And so as everyone knows, everything went online. Well, we were the only meat producer at the market that had an online presence. Mm -hmm. And so those customers from the market, before the market, the market ended up starting an online store but it took them a month to get going. And so when people would call the market and say, Hey, where did, you know, who, where I can, can I go buy meat? They would just throw them to our website. Cause we were the only ones that had a website going. And so that was a, a huge boon in our business was, was COVID. That sounds bad, but COVID, I mean, within weeks we were almost sold out of everything. They just like a stampede. And so COVID was a, a real big uptick in our business. And then we've been able to just maintain those customers and, and keep them going. Mm -hmm. We're currently not at the farmer's market as of today. Uh, we still are participating in, in their online section, but we don't physically go to the market. Uh, it took Boise quite a while to open up. And it was a year and a half, two years. And so we just didn't go back. We had our on-farm store that was being built. And so we just, um, we just focused all in on that. And so, we still do the online through them, but th that was a big blessing. Farmers markets are, I call it a necessary evil. Uh, they're a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, they will wear you out and you have more broken packages than, than you want to admit. Um, just because you're always trying to go through stuff and find, find it. So the more organized you can be, smaller coolers that you can lift easier not these big giant coolers that are so heavy and then you have to filter through all the product, but uh, farmer's markets, a good farmer's market, I would say, not these little tiny ones. You'll spend a lot of time and not get a lot back, <clears throat> but if you can get into a real good market, it is a, it's a great marketing tool. And so I, yes, I have to admit that Boise farmer's market really did help us. And, you know, if need be, we could always go back uh, mm -hmm. to that in person and, that market's actually doing even better uh, than it ever has, but we've just chose to not spend all that time on Saturday. Grind, you grind all day <clears throat> Friday to get ready for Saturday. You get up early, get there. You're just worn out talking to people all day. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a different work than physical work. Mm -hmm. And then you still have to go home and put everything away. Yeah. And typically you don't bring what everyone wants. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's chefs or a, online or social media but every saturday was something different that people mm -hmm. wanted uh, and it's like if i lived closer then you could just go and get more of that same mm -hmm. product but 
it's so hard to predict what they want. And that's what's nice about having an online presence. They can just go in and order if it's available. So markets are kind of hard to predict what people are going to want for the week. Uh, but there's just usually eggs are, are kind of like that. They're not our loss leader, but they're kind of that gateway drug for us. Yeah. Of It brings people to the booth. It brings people to the website because it's something used almost every day. And so having those eggs, it's one of the most labor intensive parts of the farm, mm -hmm. but we keep it around because it's that gateway drug. Yeah. It seems to be that way for many diversified farms. Yeah. 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 And so eggs, it, eggs is something we'll keep around, even though it causes the most work. Yeah. Yeah. So with the chickens and the turkeys, I know some people have concerns about disease spread between those two species. Have you seen anything like that? Are you doing anything specific to prevent that? Yeah, so we use a separate brooder and we use a separate pasture for the turkeys. Okay. So we, about two years in, we kept them mixed, not even focused on it. And we got blackhead okay. and our turkeys. And so we, we ended up, on that, when we first got blackhead, we ended up joining uh, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association, join, they call it APA, but A-P-P-P-A. Yeah, they're a great resource. There's so much knowledge there. They have a fantastic conference. I think one of the best conferences I've been to is the A-P-P-P-A conference. And we were able to go there and really start figuring out, oh crap, we're screwing up a lot of things. And so now we do keep them separate. We we have a lot of native birds. They carry the blackhead with them. And so it spreads into the turkeys anyways, mm -hmm. but it's just, it's a slower process. The other thing we use, we work with Pertrell and we actually have a, a mix. It's an organic mix of like cayenne pepper and some clay. Mm -hmm. There's a few other things in it that we keep uh, the turkeys have access to in their feed. Interesting. And so we feed that when, once they go to pasture, they get access to that mix mm -hmm. and sometimes mix it in their feed. And that has kept blackhead almost to, to zero oh, okay. doing that mix. And it, it helps shed those, uh, the, the disease in their intestinal tract and they just poop it back out. And so, but we gained all that from APPPA. Yeah. We didn't, you know, that, that knowledge came from there. So yes, there is issues mixing them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we still get it from the native birds. So you can't get away from all of it. You just have to have prevention methods. Yeah. Yep. Those are some good resources. Um, how, do you have any issues with predation? I mean, it looks like your, your meat chickens are pretty much enclosed. So maybe not with them, but are you having predation issues with any of your other birds? Uh, we do. So all of our pastures, we chose to net it off and then we have hot wire down pretty low. So okay. we keep, and we have dogs with all the poultry. So we keep most of the, the bigger foxes and coyotes, local dogs. That's been pretty easy. Where we run into problems is, our biggest problem is, is owls and, and hawks. The, uh, not barn owls, but it's, it's the great horned owl that we have out here. So our lane hens get locked up every night. They're, they're, we don't do any netting besides the outside border. Okay. And then our lane hens get locked up at night. The turkeys get locked up at night. And then the broilers are already in their enclosure. Mm -hmm. We've had a few weasels get into the broilers, yeah. but pretty minimal. We we're able okay. to find those. Uh, we have some skunks that get into the lane hens. Uh, at night and we've we've kind of fixed that but the aerial is our biggest problem now and when it comes into the fall when they're migrating it, it's just sometimes we just have to go in early I mean it's so bad we're in a we're in a protected zone um, a birds of prey zone and so a lot of it is they're trying to build it and so mm -hmm. we're in a pretty heavy hawk area and it just gets to the point we will we could have up to 50 hawks in the fall circling those lane mm -hmm. hens and so when it gets to that point we just have to go in because the dogs we haven't got any dogs that will go after the hawks mm -hmm. they, okay they just let it happen and i don't know 
I wish they would do it different, but I haven't got a good dog to do that yet. And so then we just move into our winter house. Yeah. But the turkeys get big enough. We don't have a problem with the aerial predators in the fall. Um, but that's, that's how we've, we've managed the predation. Gotcha. And then bouncing back to marketing quick, I'm just curious, you said it's really important to collect emails. I definitely agree with that. How are you going about collecting emails from customers? Our website, we just have a prompt that comes up if they're new to the website that it'll collect their email that way if, they'll, if they put it in. At the market, we just actually had papers and every person we checked out, we just said, hey, are you on our, are you on our email list? Mm -hmm. And if not, then they would put it down. And we were just, we were just very vigilant about asking about that email list. And mm -hmm. anytime I, I'm out in the public and talking about it, I'll try to collect their email. Mm -hmm. Hey, give me your email, uh, text it to me, whatever. And we'll put you on that list. Cause it's it, sales are directly tied to the email. I mean, yeah. it just, it just works. And so we're just really conscious about asking and yeah. people are, most of the time, very willing mm -hmm. and have very, very few people cancel off the list. It's just the, the list just keeps building. And so, yeah, that's awesome. And then you guys send a newsletter or maybe you're selling sales promotions or sending sales promotion emails. Uh, every week we send, we send at least one email. Okay. And then if we have, you know, sales promotions, we'll do that midweek. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but every Sunday morning we send an email out to that main list and then we will, we have a drip that it kind of customer, like when somebody signs up every couple of days, they get emails. So we've, we've done the drip thing mm -hmm. and just kind of that customer building that relationship, telling yeah. them, telling the story of who we are and, and all that. So we didn't have that in the beginning, but we have that now. Mm -hmm. and yeah. That, that seems well. Yeah. I think that's, that's one of the crucial steps to really building a customer base and retaining people over time, because if you are interacting with them at the farmer's market, or maybe you're going and speaking somewhere, they have that one touch. And then if you can get their email, then you can nurture that relationship with that customer over time and then hopefully retain them or convince them to make a purchase at some point. And then the quality of your product speaks from there. Yep. Agreed. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, I'll take a couple questions from the audience. So, um, Barry Dunkel from Bull Idaho is asking, so you've, you've had multiple years of no-till on the pasture. Have you ever used a petrometer to test for soil compaction? If so, um, what has been your experience? He's also asking if you've ever used a, a field aerator to address that same potential issue. I know Barry, Barry, how's it going? Um, <laughs> yeah, I actually carry a soil penetrometer everywhere I go. Uh, interesting this year. So last fall and then this spring, we've had really heavy rains, more than normal, uh, really pounding rains. And, and so this spring, I had some of the tightest soils in that top couple inches. You get down below it and it was good. And so every year, gives you some problems. And so I don't know if we kind of moved calcium because of those heavy rains, we flush calcium or something, but uh, we, this year we did have some problems in that top inch on fields, on my row crop fields, on my pastures. I, I, I haven't had that, that experience this spring, but yeah, um, we do get compaction, uh, something we definitely have to watch out for. I haven't used a field aerator. I, I've been tempted to, but I, I haven't used it yet. Um, try to just keep the water getting in. We irrigate, and so uh, trying to keep that water flush going on. Um, but it, there are some fields that probably would benefit from some type of aer aeration where the cattle have overgrazed at times. So, yeah. And then did you ever use a petrometer to test for compaction? Yeah, I do. The yeah, soil penetrometer, I, I do, I use it all year long and I do have some fields that have levels in it and I'm trying to work through that with cover crops. If it gets to a point where I can't seem to make progress, then we'll have to do something. But at this point, I haven't had to do any tillage. Okay. Okay. And then Barry is also asking how you maintain species diversity in your pastures and then kind of give an example of what the ideal species diversity looks like for you. 
Um, that it's kind of changed over the years. Um, I'm my main pasture. I'm actually, uh, we took it out and put a cover crop and some corn in, in it and just kind of renewing it because in my area, at least, um, over time, the pasture tries to go back to fescue, a native mm -hmm. fescue of some sort. And so even though we're moving them frequently, it, it's just over time that seed bank takes over. I really like chicory and plantain, um, clovers, diversity of grasses. Um, but all those seem to only last so long. And then we're having to reseed. I tried, I, I have success frost seeding clover. Um, I drill it anytime I'm drilling anywhere in my pastures, I'm always throwing a little, uh, chicory and plantain in and you get it in pockets, but it's, it is hard. That question is what he's asking is very hard without doing a full reset on the pasture. It is hard to get those other species back in and keep maintaining that diversity. It wants to just go back to grass. And, and so it is a struggle if other people have any ideas <laughs> without just taking the grass all the way out. Uh, it's, it seems to try to get back to a, um, more grass in my area. Mm -hmm. Some of the clovers stay in in some spots, but they, they kind of go away too. So mm -hmm. it is a struggle and we just renew it with more seed yeah. at some point. I think that, uh, I think it was Nicole Masters suggested adding chicory seed to mineral. Have you, well, to like the cattle's mineral to then pass through the rumen and then seed that way. Are you um, testing anything like that or have you tried something like that for seeding? I haven't, I haven't done it with chicory. We did it with, with clover uh, a long time ago. And then the next year I just let the clover head out and then went back after we irrigated a couple of days and there was clover sprouting out of the cow manure. And so I know it passes. I know it do does the job. Mm -hmm. um, I just, besides the one year on the clover, I've never done chicory, but some of the seeds pass. I didn't think chicory would, but there are seeds that will get through the room and stay viable. Mm -hmm. And then um, chicory is really known for its deworming property. Are you guys, do you have any type of deworming protocol or um, are you using any specific plants to help with that? Uh, one of the main reasons I like plantain and chicory uh, in the pasture is so they can select it. No, we don't do any horons. If we have an animal that, that just looks real tough, um, we, you know, we'll, we will treat that animal. And then I have a, a uh, feedlot that I can rent and I'll put that animal in there and feed them for 30 days. I don't want anything, any of that getting on my land because I'm really trying to build my dung beetle population, but it's been slow. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure my chickens are harming me more than anything. Uh, but so if, if that animal does get real rough, we'll put them out, you know, and then we'll ear tag them separately. But you know, animal welfare is definitely important. I don't want something that's just, you know, got a bunch of issues, but the other reasons why we try to graze high and, and keep away from a lot of that stuff, but I, I won't allow any of that to get to the pasture. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, um, another person is asking about how many head of cattle or pounds of beef are you currently selling direct to consumer? And then the same question for pork, and I'm sure people would be interested to learn about birds as well. All right, so currently we, we're we processing about 200 head of beef every year. Uh, I'm on a meeting right now. Just set it on the counter, sorry. <laughs> so we do 200 head of beef, um, 300 head of hogs. Uh, this year we'll have 9,000 broilers, uh, 500 turkeys, and we have 3,000 laying hens. Okay. So. And then for the, I know you're, you're not able to do sausages or any of those types of products, but are you doing individual cuts for the birds or are you doing whole birds? Uh, we, yeah, so we do holes and they will cut up uh, the birds into okay. different breasts or leg quarters, all those different things. We just can't do the, we can't do grind. That's our only limitation on poultry. On the beef and pork, we do sausage. They, they do grind <clears throat> in the sausage. We just can't do the the cured products of bacon and ham. 
So then another person is asking, how are you able to pull the chicken tractor sideways? And then what is the water set up in them? It looked like you had those, those um, water feeders hanging from the, the roof of the tractor. Yeah, so we, if you can imagine the base of, you know, 15 by 60. So on the base, uh, every 15 feet, there is a, a, a runner, call it, that is on the ground. That's what gets pulled. And then we have a cable that goes to every one of the runners on the ground. And so when we pull, every one of the runners has an equal pull coming from it. And then the, the outside base that the hoops are connected to just sit on those runners. Okay. And then it just it just pulls forward <clears throat> inside on all the runners. And then around the whole edge, we take belting, like an eight inch wide belting and put that on there because the first house we didn't do that with and it sucks chickens legs in that, that round, we use two and three eighths pipe and that round pipe just going right beside that that chicken walking, if it catches a toe, it, it, it'll just pull the whole body under. It's crazy. So we put that belting so it kind of keeps them from getting close to the pipe. And then it also is a deterrent on the outside from predators trying to, to get in. So that's, awesome. that's a good tip. I, I've moved chicken tractors before and we have to go in with like maracas and shake them and keep them away from the edges so they don't get run over. So that's, so, that's a good tip. Yeah. One other thing with that is that we use a winch on a pickup that's that's a, a like a Bluetooth type winch. And so one person can move them. So we have, we'll, they, chickens hate flags, like cattle flags more than like the rattles. And so we just walk on the outside. We don't even go in the house and we use that Bluetooth winch and we move it forward and we walk down those edges keeping them off the back wall because the back wall will still suck them under if they stay there long enough. And so we just move them out that way and just keep it moving forward. Awesome. Um, another person is asking how many acres approximately do you have devoted to the farm to consumer enterprise? Uh, in season, it's 200 okay. acres. And then in the fall, we'll move those cattle onto our cover crops you know, on the cash the crop acres. That sounds good. Well, we're getting close to the end here. Um, one of the themes that we have um, of our soil health resource guide this year is talking about legacy. It sounds like this land has been in your family for four generations, your kids now being the fifth generation, and you've gone through kind of a massive transition of being more of a custom hay operation, transitioning to now like a direct-to-consumer diversified animal operation. What does that mean um, for your family's legacy and the type of operation that you're then passing on to your children? Hopefully it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a lot more hands-on physical work than, than what it was before. I mean, it was a lot of hours before, but it was a lot of just driving tractor. And so I know some of the kids, it doesn't meet what they want, right? They would rather be in a tractor. Some of them, some of them love the animals. <clears throat> but still being a bigger farm, we found farm around a thousand acres still. Um, they get a little bit of both. And so, you know, my hope and dream is that a couple of them want to continue it on. I have a couple boys that have voiced a uh, desire to, to keep it moving. Um, but just having, the, yeah, the legacy is important. But what brings me some of the most joy is on those days when the customers come to the farm, my children really get into that and they will go and they will tell the story direct to that customer and having a little eight, 10 year old kid tell that customer why it's important that they're there at the farm. Um, that is when it's full circle for me is, and, and hopefully for my dad as well. And he loves telling the story too. He'll, he'll do the tractor rides all day. He, he loves that. But just seeing those kids, get engaged and understand why it's important to soil, why it's important to their health and how that all affects. I mean, it just brings me a lot of a joy. And, and that is what is the full circle for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, 
Well, thank you everyone so much for joining today. This was a great presentation, Brad. Thank you for taking the time and uh, you shared your contact information so people can go back and look at that and reach out if they have any questions or um, if they're in your area, they can, sounds like they can come visit the farm as well. So that's great. Always open. Excellent. Awesome. Well, as always, um, all of these webinars are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. So you can always go back and watch them or send the link to a friend. Um, thank you so much for joining today and we'll look forward to seeing you guys next time. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Brad.